Okay. We are almost there. Okay, we are there. Hello, everybody. It's Uncle Grumpy. Welcome to Grumpy Tonight. Tonight, I'm here with Greg Sadler. Greg is running for Senate seat uh, District 17, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, Greg, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick while I share this to a few places. Sure. Uh, like you said, uh, well, first off, thanks for having me on the show tonight here. Um, my name is Greg Sadler. I'm running for Senate District 17. That uh, it, It's a little bit of a funny-sized district, kind of an L-shaped. It goes all the way from Luther and Jones, barely getting just a little bit of Oklahoma, eastern Oklahoma County through Choctaw, McLeod, Para, all the way over to Shawnee and the, the northern part of Piawatomie County there. Um, like I said, I'm the Libertarian candidate. There'll be only two people in on your ballot come this fall. It'll be the Republican and myself. The Republicans are currently in a runoff race, which will happen August 25th, and then they'll take on. I'll take on whoever the winner of that that race is. Um, just a little about myself. Um, I'm an old country boy. This is my first time running for any kind of office. Uh, I just kind of, and people ask me, Hey, what, what led you to this point? why did you, why did you want to run? And I kind of joke and say, Hey, I have trouble finding somebody on the vote. I want on the ballot. I want to run for. So I, I thought I'd put my own name down there. Um, really, I just, I've just gotten frustrated with the amount of government intrusion on, on everything. The, the high taxes, it, it seems like we're paying more every year. And we're having less freedom every year. I, I'd like to take us, you know, I, sometimes as libertarians, we talk about something in the future, but really what we're talking about in, in a, on a lot of things is taking us back and giving us some of the freedoms that we used to have that are, that are slowly being whittled away. Um, I live on a little acreage here in, in Nuala with my wife and our three boys. We've raised you know, from Cajun from time to time we raise cattle, but we've got goats and uh, different critters like that. So we're just, it, kind of simple country folks we just wanted to you know kind of do our own thing and and not have so much government intrusion you know well let me first say how much i respect anybody's uh willingness to step up and put their head on the chopping chopping block um especially if you've never done it before this the first time i'm sure is is a big risk and uh, it takes a lot to do that so so um that in itself i think earns you the respect of us hearing out some of your ideas. So in that uh, aspect, I'd like to ask, so let's start local with your particular local area as if you were to be the Senator representing that area, what would you try and do for specifically that area that you see issues with? Sure. Um, some of the, the, the local things that I see, um, some of the deregulation is some of the things I'd like to look at. You know, there is a lot of small towns. You have people opening up a barber shop or a, a tanning salon, nail salon, whatever it might be. For whatever reason, we think that they have to have a permit to, to do that. Uh, you know, if, if I go to a, a barber and they cut my hair and I don't like it, I don't come back next time. I, I don't think that they should be paying what I call a, a ransom in order to to be able to run some of those services. Um, I understand that's legitimate in some industries. In other industries, I'd prefer we kept kept the government out of it. Um, and I also believe that a lot of people in my area have kind of feel the same way. You know, we're just, we're not big city folks here. We're, we're just people that wanna make a living, put food on the table for our family, and, and we'd like to be left alone in order to do that kind of. Now, you said Ron Sharp has that seat right now? That's correct. Uh, he's had he's had it for the the last two cycles. Um, he's only eligible for one more cycle, um, but but he's never he's obviously ran in Republican primaries, but he's ran unopposed both those other two times, and 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 that was one of the other reasons when I saw this race come up. You know, and that's kind of what my campaign's about is giving people options and choices. I, I don't ever want to be pegged where I, I don't have an option. Even if you only, even if you have two, I'd prefer three or four. You know, people want to have options on how they live and what they who they can vote for, and having only one person on there isn't much of an option. Now, there's there's no Democrat in that race, right? There is. Yeah, that's correct. There are no Democrats running. Okay, so if you weren't running, then it would be settled by this primary runoff that they're having. That's correct. Yep. The, that is correct. That's how it's been the last two cycles. You know, something I noticed that I don't think many people paid enough attention to 
about uh, two thirds of the seats were all decided in the primary. Yes. Yep. There's so little actual adjusting of position when it comes down to the November election, which is the one most people participate in. Uh, if they would participate sooner in the game, I think we we might see more change, which I only see as a good thing. Yes. So, um, so what were you doing before you say you've run, run uh, you've had cattle and things like that? What other industries? Yeah, have you worked? I, I, sure, sure. Um, I, I grew, like I say, I grew up on a cattle farm. Um, but uh, uh, after I went to college, after I got out of college, I, I was hired by a printing company. It's actually the largest printing company in, in the country. And I've been there for, oh, just, just around 20 years now. So I, I've been working with, you know, we print catalogs, magazines, things like that. It, it's given me good experience, um, not only working in groups and teams, but one of the big things that I, in our company is something we call lean which is doing more with less, which nowadays is what everybody's doing. You know, how can we accomplish this goal with, you know, less equipment, less time, less money? How, how, how do we do that? And that's kind of what I want to look at is it, we could definitely lean up our government a little bit. So you have a nine to five right now. Is that what you're I do. Yes. True. Okay. And, and what will you do if you if you win this seat? Will you keep that nine to five? Will you be? Able to I will not. No, I will not. No, uh, th this will this will be my my full time thing. Yeah, because I, I know most of the ones I've met up there that had other careers. A lot of them, anyway, have set those aside at least while they're in office. They yeah, they yep. find time to do both. It this used to be somewhat of a temporary job or a or a part time job being a legislator, from what I understand. But it's become considerably more um time consuming which i think is what's justified some of the races sure sure definitely so as far as the state uh you say licensure is an issue for you um from a state aspect if you were to, to get into the capital uh what sort of changes would you be looking to make there or or tweaks would you think we need to make to current issues uh sure um obviously i look at it as, as a libertarian I, I want sneaking. To point out, you're, you're, this show's been stolen already but we'll I, keep going, so. <laughs> somebody's sneaking behind me there yeah. um I, i'd like to look at taxes in general I, I think that there's a lot of waste there there's a lot of uh, we you know once you pay a tax it never goes down one you know nothing's nothing's ever more permanent than a temporary program when it comes to the government it they these don't go away they don't go down but i'd really like to look at a lot of these things and, and reducing these taxes one of the things i've been hitting on here recently a little bit is the the grocery tax we're one of i think 13 states that still charge tax on groceries in the 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 other state and in the majority of the states ta groceries are tax exempt and i think 2020 with the pandemic and the you know we're giving out stimulus checks to people if we truly care about the low-income folks why are we st still char charging them a tax on groceries you know we we say that we want to help people but by god we have to get our, get our tax out of his loaf of bread and his jar of peanut butter you know so, and, and so that doesn't make you, sense to me have you shopped that idea around what kind of support do you get for that i've heard that mentioned in the past by others but it never lasts long you're you're right it, and, and and i'm trying to <laughs> i'm trying to understand why that hasn't taken off prior to now because it, you know there are states that there like i said there's very few states that still have that but somehow that that idea has fallen flat in the past it's it's not something that uh, i want to give up i'm still still kind of pushing that idea you know it's uh it's a tax that whether you make four hundred thousand dollars a year or you make forty thousand dollars a year you're paying the same tax for that those groceries and you know in that particular transaction so it, it seems to me that it hits the the lower income folks the hardest i just think it, it doesn't make any sense when we think about you know your prescription drugs we don't don't pay the taxes on those but yet we do on groceries and, and both of them are necessities in my opinion so well, obviously you do have to eat and we pay taxes, high taxes on the medical marijuana. So yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, that's something we can get to as well. Yeah. Why are we, if, if it's medical and it's a prescription that you need, why is that taxed the way that it is? And so high when it's a prescription and the other ones don't, you know, so. Well, it's, it's not a prescription. It's a recommendation. Recommendation. Sure. It's only a loophole. It's only a technicality. It's just, it's, it's the same thing. A doctor writes it. So. Sure. 
sure. it's really no different. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um, is there any other libertarians in the Capitol right now sitting in, in seats? There are not, no. Okay. I, so, I would be the first in, in the history of Oklahoma, if I, if I understand right. So would you, wh which party have you found you would be able to work with the best? Because you'll have to work with one party or okay. the other, or both, if you can pull that off. But that's a hard fence to ride. I try it every day. It's very difficult. <laughs> so how, yeah. how are you going to do that? That's a good question. You know, and, and I kind of looked at that too. You know, I might, I might walk in there and no one might talk to me and, and I could be the loneliest person in, in Oklahoma if I'm there. But on the other hand, when, you know, if you think about it, if there's someone, if there's a Republican or someone on the right that's pushing for gun rights, I, I'm def, I, I'm, I'm strong with the second amendment that, you know, the, the, it, the libertarians uh, favor gun rights more than even the Republicans do. And so if you were looking for it to pass a bill or you wanted me on a committee, you knew that you'd have my votes to, to support gun rights on, on that end there. Now, if it was look, if you're on the other side and you're looking at say criminal justice, well, I, I would be in favor of that as well. If you're someone on the left was pushing a criminal justice bill. No, you so, know, I was gonna, I was going to ask you how you were going to pull that off, but that's good. That's good. Yeah. Criminal justice. Yes. That would definitely be something usually more pushed by the democratic side. Yeah. So, yeah. and sometimes it doesn't mean a whole lot, but I know whenever these bills come out, they sure like to say bipartisan support. Well, I, I'd be your bipartisan person, you know? Yeah, well, that's good. So what sort of issues do you see that the state uh, could really use some help with that where you think that people just don't aren't seeing the forest through the trees? Um, well, there's a, there's a handful of things. Um, the, the, the criminal justice, uh, since we started there already, the criminal justice is, is a big part of it. Why is Oklahoma almost always the top in incarceration rates or at least the top handful anyway? That that just doesn't make any sense to me. Why, why do we have laws that we're constantly putting, locking people up for in what I call a lot of victimless crimes? There's legitimate crimes and those are the crimes that we need to have our law enforcement going, going after folks for. But, you know, there, there has to be a better system than what we have, you know, when, you know, you know, it's just drug, drug offenses and things like that. If there isn't anyone involved, there has to be a better way than just simply locking somebody up or, or some of these minimums that, the, that we have where there's no decision making process left up to a judge. Every situation is different, you know, and, and you can't say I know that the three strikes and you're out kind of has is, is been tweaked a little bit, but there's still minimums out there. I'd prefer to give the judges those opportunities to say, hey, this is appropriate in this case. This is not appropriate in this case. Um, there, there's just, you know, and I've heard that there's so many people that are locked up simply on traffic violation tickets. Somebody is driving without a, a, an insurance, without an insurance card, or they have traffic violations. They don't have a job. They can't pay it. Next thing happens is there's a warrant that goes out for their arrest. Now they're in jail and the state's paying for them to live there when they probably just lost their job because they were put in jail. So now there really is no opportunity to pay it back. And that that's, you know, that's a that's an entire mess right there we, that we need to uh, that we need to sort out because we can't, you know, uh, I like to think Oklahomans as being the the most generous, hardworking folks around. Everybody's, you know, we're some of the nicest folks in the country compared to some other places that I've lived. And why are we putting so many people in, in cages like that? That that's something that bothers me a lot that, that we, we have to come up with a better system than that. We we have we can't have. And in some ways, I like to say we can't more we can't legislate morality. You may say this is not right, but if there's not, but that's that's your own values there. You okay. know. So, so let me look, let me ask you. Sorry, I mean interrupt, but let me ask you about. Oh, no, go ahead. About the uh, incarceration issue, uh, do you think that our private prisons um, feed to that? In other words, the need to keep beds full. Do you think that adds to the number of people that are incarcerated in the state and the offenses that will put you behind bars for lengthy periods of time, whether it be 90 days or, or nine years. What, sure. What about sure. That, that, that's a good, good, that's a good question. Um, I think as it is now, you're probably right. It probably does feed into that. 
could we change that? You know, I'm, and as a libertarian, I'm, uh, I'm always for privatization. I, I'm not a fan of, you know, the, the privatization can have some problems, but the state is, is in my opinion, always going to have more. Um, you could set up a system that where that wasn't the incentive, you know, it, you know, whether someone keeps, you have uh, repeat offenders, well, maybe that maybe the prison doesn't get paid as much for the second time around or the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time. Um, th there's not a silver bullet for this, obviously, but it's something I think we need to look at. I'm not against private prisons, but I think there's a better way to do it because having an incentive where you're paid just on the amount of, of uh, prisoners you have in there, well, it's going to lead to the problem just like you mentioned there. Okay. Yeah. That's definitely one we need to look a little farther into because I, I don't see me personally, I don't see how private prisons um, can be anything other than for profit. I mean, they have to make money. So how sure I, I don't see how that, I just see that as morally wrong. And, and I see as it, it leads to way too many issues with what goes on in the prisons. They're oh, certainly, yes. certainly not safe and uh, rehabilitation has so little to do with incarceration in Oklahoma. I, I just did a post the other day about the price of the phone calls. Um, you know, they, they charge an absorbent amount just to be able to make phone calls. So, yeah. okay, <laughs> well, we'll move on to something else. Um, sure. So let's see, what other issues does the state have you think we might uh, need to take a hard look at? Um, some, of the th some of the things I was looking at, um, I, I wanted to make sure that school choice is going to be a, a big question here in, in, in this race here, possibly. Um, our current senator isn't a, a fan of school choice. I'd like to see a system where families can make the decision on, on where to send their kids to school, not necessarily a zip code. I'd like to, you know, whether they want to send their kids to, to the public school or to a charter school or home school or private school, whatever they want to do, I want to make sure that people are given that option, especially in 2020 with the pandemic going on. Um, I think that's a, a lot of folks are reaching out for options they might not have thought about a year or two ago. And that's something I want to make sure that we have a, a system where people can do that. Ideally, I'd like to see the money follow the, the child or the family instead of just putting all the money into a school and which in theory may have been good at one time, but with so many levels of, of what I call management or, you know, supervision, um, the money does, I feel like the money doesn't really get to the, 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 the bottom level to, to help the children. It, okay, so, that should. so let me ask you this. Um, so you say the money should follow the child and or family was the word you used. So we homeschooled our kids for the first half of their lives. And then they did public school um, for parts of it after that and some more homeschooling. And uh, my last one's finishing up now uh, with her homeschooling. <clears throat> Are you saying that, that homeschool parents should be getting that money? Because it certainly would have helped. Provided yes. now, now I would also agree if I was going to be one of those parents that received some of that money, provided there was criteria that you met. Or, sure. or test, test that they took periodically or something to show progress, to show that the money was going for what it was intended for. Is that what you're saying? You would yes. Do? Yep. Yep. As long as, as long as, you know, we have some, some general basis of, of, of a level of competency between the grades, you know, as you, as you progress throughout the years, but it sure be nice for the families like that, that, you know, your, your property taxes and your taxes are going to a, a school that you're not using. You know, that, that does, that'd be like sending all my want money to Crest, but I really shop at Walmart, you know, it, 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 that, that doesn't, you know, hold water with me. I think that, you know, when there's other government programs, say, for example, like, you know, your, your, your food stamps or your welfare, that money goes to the children. That doesn't go to a grocery store in the same way. I kind of look at the education system that, Hey, if you're not using it, Shouldn't you get a little something back to, to help you make those choices? Um, we may not, and, and in a broader sense, uh, as you can see, the, the little guy that snuck behind me here, uh, we've got a, a six-year-old here. The way that he learns and the, what he's going to learn about and, and, and take in the world 
isn't going to be the same way that I learned, you know, 40 some years ago. It, it's it, the world's changing. We can't just get stuck in this rut of this. We always send the kids here and they always do this. It, for some folks, that might be fine. For other kids, it, there's other ways of learning. You know, I just like kind of the, the thing that my, my message is I'd like to have options for everybody. And this, this kind of fits in that mold. Okay. So let me move to the big one here that uh, usually most of the people on here want to hear about and that be your, your views on cannabis. Now I'm assuming uh, it's pretty easy to assume being a libertarian and you already said some things about uh, victimless crimes and things like that. So I'm assuming you're, you're pretty open to, uh, to this idea. So what do you yeah. think, um, without not asking you to hang yourself here, but what do you think of our current program, the way it's working and, and the ideas um, of how to move forward as a libertarian? Sure. I mean, obviously, I'm, I was very happy when 788 passed that we have some form of this. And my understanding is that our form of, uh, of medical is better than in some states. We probably have a little ways to go there. But overall, what I, I see this as a progression. We, we have medical now. The world hasn't come, come to an end. You know, some of the folks that were, were against it were very adamant that, oh, God, terrible things were going to happen if we, if we allow this into our state. Well, that didn't happen. You, you, can see, you can go and see the dispensaries as you drive through the towns. They're, they're there. I don't see anything negative going on whatsoever. None of the, the, the ones that called for the, the sky is falling. That didn't happen. I like to think that that makes folks that maybe were against it a little more comfortable now and saying, Hey, this is going to be here. It's no different than, than, than any other store here. It's not a problem. Why do we have this? I call it kind of a funny system where you have to get a card in order to you, for you to walk into the dispensary and make, and make a purchase that, that seems a little funny. You know, I don't have to, if I want a bottle of bourbon, I don't have to, get a card to walk in a liquor store. I don't have to get a card to go to my CVS and get my prescriptions. It, you know, that just, it seems like they're kind of selling back our rights to us a little bit at a time. And as long as you jump through these loopholes, we'll, we'll let you have this. I, I personally would just like to have a availability for, for all adults, you know, whether we want to keep a, a medical program as well, that's fine. Uh, you know, have folks that specialize in just, just the medical but, you know, it's still on the books. If you don't have a card and you're pulled over for it, that, that's still illegal. And, and that, that doesn't hold any water with me. It, it, it's no different than anything else. If you're an adult, you should be able to have, you should be able to control what you consume and the government shouldn't, shouldn't be involved in that process. Uh, let me ask you uh, about this. You, you acknowledge a medical program versus a full access program. Um, so you would see a different tax structure with those two different programs, the medical being as low as possible or zero or what, what would you yeah, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd like, I'd like, you know, if we're going to have, uh, we, if we don't get taxed on prescription drugs, I, I know that the terminology is a little different, but this is a prescription to me. Why are we, would we being taxed on this? There's, there's people that, that really need this medication and, we feel the need here again, just like if you really need this medication, it's important for you, for you to be able to live and function in society, just like I was talking about the grocery tax. Why are we taxing food? That's something that people need to live and function in society. That, that just ethically, that doesn't sit well with me. I, I don't think that should be, should be taxed. The other, you know, and as a libertarian, I'm about as anti-tax as you can get on everything anyway. Right. But, and but I understand as a libertarian, that's going to be your position. That your your starting position on tax is zero, um, and, and I think that's great. The um, as a pragmatist, I I'm trying to get things done, and I, sure, I sure. think that we are so many years away from cannabis being tomatoes. Like most libertarians say to me, they say yep. it should be tomatoes. Well, yes, it should, but we're so many years away from that being happening. From that happening that I think we have to accept, unfortunately, it's a compromise. We have to accept some things like some taxes. Now they shouldn't be high, but we should, you know, accept a little taxes where necessary um, 
because it, the option would be waiting so many years. I mean, true, true. Waiting so many years. And let me ask you this. I think this is um, something the state is looking at right now. It's something I've been uh, whispering in their ear for a while now. We could be pulling in about $800 million a year from Texas alone if we had a full access program with a little tax. Um, you know, what kind of benefit do you see the state getting from uh, a full access program from people? And this is something that's taboo to a lot of people, but I want to talk about it specifically from out of state customers. Yep. Yep. No, no, I, I, I like that. And, and I brought this up before you, you they, they might have to uh, widen the lanes on, on 35 there when you're crossing the red, red river there, because you're, you know, with no, in, in last I checked, Texas does not have a program w whatsoever as far as. Well, they, um, they do have a recent program, but it's pretty restrictive. It's pretty really, restrictive. Really restrictive. Yeah. If you had, had access here, I mean, the amount of money that would come from Texas. I mean, you could say, you know, Kansas and Arkansas possibly too, but Texas is really where it's going to come from. You know, the, you know, remember back when, when tattoos were illegal here and everybody had them set up on the borders of Kansas and Texas, it, you know, you might have a situation like that because the amount of, the amount of people that would come up from Texas, I think, I think you're, you're hitting it on the head there. That would more than offset it. If you had a, a medical pro program, where the medical folks did not pay tax, you would more than make up for that in in, in tax for uh, you know recreation, if you want to call it that. Okay, well let me let me address something that's an issue that, that I've seen in other states that I think we need to pay attention to should this happen, and that is the the homeless situation in states that uh, bring a, in a, a recreational program or full access program, um, they tend to increase their homeless. But it's not from what the reefer madness people say from everybody, all the, you know, no job people move into their state to sit around smoking weed. It's from the property values going up in the cities. Um, all to, like in, in Denver, all the bed and breakfasts used to be people's houses. And so yeah, that yeah. that put a lot of people out. Um, can you see a way and this would be a goal of mine would be to find a way to make sure the state is on the front side of that. I don't want to see us doing like Oregon did. I think it was last year and throwing $5 million at a homeless problem that we've already created. I'd rather put that money on the front side and not create that homeless problem. True. True. Yeah. And I, I don't know if we would see that to the extent some of the other States would it, I mean, that's a good question. What would happen if, if we had, you know, folks moving here from, from all other States, from, North Texas, where, wherever it may be. And it could cause the, 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 you know, the cost of living, your, your, your housing prices to go up. Um, I, I don't know if there's a necessarily a silver bullet with that. Um, I kind of like to let the, I like to let the market kind of, you know, d dictate on, on how things are going to be. I, I, I my fear is always, you know, and sometimes we, we can, you can have uh, the government get involved where they say, where they kind of set rent rental, you know, restrictions on how high it can rent ceilings, things like that. Um, I'm not a fan of getting them involved. Every time you get the government involved, they, they typically uh, make make a problem worse, but uh, it's good to, to acknowledge that, that that could happen, that uh, prices in, it could go up, cost of living yeah. could go up, things like that. Yeah, I know a lot of people are shocked to hear that come out of me. They think all I do is spread sunshine and rainbows about full access. But there are things we have to look at. And that would yep. be, uh, I saw some language in a petition. It doesn't matter which one. It's not alive anymore. But I saw some language in a petition that would have given uh, some of the cannabis money to charities to help deal with this problem on the front side. And I just thought that was an incredible idea. And, and again, that's what I'd like to see our state doing. So I would ask if you get in this position to keep that in mind, that if we bring in, or well, when we bring in full access, because we, we are going to, one yes. way or the other eventually, um, that we keep that in mind so that we deal with it on the front side and on the back side. That, that's an issue for me, it really is. Yeah, and I, and I do think that, I mean, you don't know how, how these other states feel about it, but I, I can't see, you know, if, if we were to go full access like that, 
I can't see Texas not following our lead at some point. It might be a while, but at some point I would see the other states kind of want to catch up. Um, how soon that would happen or you know, how, much, how much resistance they would have in that situation, I don't know. But, you know, uh, the, the, the lawmakers and the government, they, they, see that, they see where the money goes. And, sometimes, and I don't think they're going to like that with seeing that money come north of the Red River like that. So oh. I think uh, other, other issues, beliefs, ethics aside, that probably puts as much pressure on them as anything. Well, I, look, I know this is supposed to be about your strategy, but let me throw you out some of mine here real quick. I think if Oklahoma sure. can do this soon, sooner rather than later, we can set ourselves up as the next Colorado. And what I mean is um, Colorado, even though it's now surrounded by all states that have full access for recreational programs, they still have the cannabis tourism. They still have all the influx. That's the place to go for everything new cannabis. Well, there's a lot of people that don't want to go that far. So if we get ahead of Texas and Arkansas and Kansas, if we get ahead of them, we set ourselves up to be that. And everything from here east suddenly only have to drive to Oklahoma. So I think doing it, I think it's extremely time sensitive. I think if we wait for the federal government to do something, which we have no idea when that will happen, um, you know, we could end up yeah. behind the curve. And if Texas beats us to it, then I think we've really lost the game. But There's a lot of money left on the table right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, well, we're coming up on 30 minutes, so I want to give you as long as you need here to uh, tell us anything you would like to get out that you feel like we haven't addressed yet. Um, nothing. I'll just I'll kind of keep it short and sweet here, I guess. Um, but like I just said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a political outsider, so – if I'm elected, I, I'm not beholden to anybody. This is a, a, a grassroots effort here. I don't have any big businesses or organizations behind me. Um, it's just from from the people that want to help me out here. Um, once it, once I'm a senator, I don't have to pay anybody back or do any special favors. Um, I, I'm kind of here on my own recognizance here. It, it, it's uh, it, it's not a, a situation where where I would be beholden to anybody. I, I, I like I said, I'm a, I'm a simple country boy. A lot of the folks in my area here are kind of the same here. Um, we're getting to the point where people aren't trusting one, uh, one party or the other, even, you know, there, a lot of folks tell me that other uh, you politicians are all crooks anyway. And, and, and it's, I understand the frustration with that. And that's kind of why I'm running is so that we have a voice, we have an option um, I, hope, I hope to spread the libertarian message of, hey, if you're not hurting somebody else, you should be free to live your life the way you want to live it. And I think most people in rural areas feel feel the exact same way. Um, I, I'd like to get the message out because I'll be honest, there are a lot of folks uh, that, that don't understand what libertarianism is about. They haven't heard of it. They, they think there's two parties in this country and that's it. And you know, no matter what happens in my race, I like to spread the message out, help help candidates that might be running two, four years down the road, um, kind of help out that way. And and, and hopefully we we uh, we do well here in the fall and, and people are looking for another option here. OK, so let me remind everybody, this is Greg Sandler, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Sandler, right? Sadler, Sadler. Yep. OK, Sadler. Well, yep. you're a country boy. Yep. Sadler. OK, I can remember that. Greg yep. Sadler, he's running for uh, Senate seat, uh, District 17. That's currently Ron Sharp's seat. Ron, if he makes it through the um, the the chat, the runoff in the Republican runoff, then it will be Greg um, against Ron because there is no Democrat. So this is a real opportunity uh, to put a libertarian um, in the building, and that could really start to change things, uh, I think, for the better for the state. I think it could only help the cannabis movement. So I'm happy to hear that. Um, I want to remind Ron Sharp and anybody else running for that seat or any other seat, whether it be a state seat or a, a tribal seat or anything else that would like to come on here and share your views. I'll give everybody about the same 30 minutes and we'll sit here and, and have a friendly conversation and we'll do our best to help spread your message. So. Okay, uh, Greg, that's about it for now. Maybe we'll have you back. Uh, sure. 
Love like to. Right after the runoff, when we know exactly who your challenger is going to be, and maybe we can get more specific in that area. That'd be great. I appreciate you having me on tonight. All right. You stay right there while I say bye to everybody else and close it down, if I can remember how. All right, folks, that's it for now. Again, I'll have more people on uh, soon, probably another one next week. Until next time, stay grumpy. I'll see you on the road. <laughs>